guys, in the spirit of my channel, you know I talk about reproductive politics. So, I'm going to be reading Reproductive Rights and Wrongs, The Global Politics of Population Control by Brett C. Hartman. You know, I really feel like I've been neglecting reading books ever since I got a job. And it's really disheartening. Like, it really makes me feel like everything is just passing me so quickly. You know, especially once you get on the internet. It just, it doesn't even matter sometimes. All right. All right. Preface to the third edition, Overpopulation, a Never-Ending Story. More than two decades have passed since the second edition of Reproductive Rights and Wrongs was published, but the book remains very relevant to the present political moment. While the term population control is out of favor, the practice hasn't died. The belief that overpopulation is a root cause of poverty, environmental degradation, resource scarcity, Migration, violent conflict, and even climate change is pervasive. It influences popular media, environmental education and advocacy, and population health development and security policies at home and abroad. Despite being cloaked in the language of women's empowerment, population control continues to have a negative impact on women's health, contraceptive choice, and human rights. While this book is an important gateway into the population controversy, it is also part of the larger body of critical work that is continually growing as new scholars, writers, and activists take up the task of challenging population control from social, environmental, and gender justice perspectives. I am grateful to the many inspiring people I have met, collaborated with, and learned from in the years since the book's publication. When you challenge a powerful conventional wisdom like overpopulation, it can feel at times like you're knocking your head against a brick wall. It's much more effective to put multiple heads, hands, and hearts together to make change, to dismantle to all together, brick by brick. Overpopulation is a particularly stubborn uh, article of faith. It persists despite changing demographic realities. The era of rapid population growth, often dubbed the population explosion, is over. Most countries have undergone a demographic transition to smaller families, better living standards, improved access to education, health care, and social security, declines in infant and child mortality, rising costs of raising children, and Im improvements in, uh, in women's uh, status, including in, uh, Employment opportunities outside the home all have encouraged smaller family size. Okay, so I just wanted to, to quickly interject here, but India's population is like a billion or, or more at this moment. So, yeah, I mean, they could be a majority of the planet in like 50 to 100 years. So, all right. So has urbanization. Now, more than half the world's population lives in towns or cities, and this proportion is rising. When I lived in the Bangladeshi village 40 years ago, an experience that inspired this book, the average number of children per woman was seven. Today, that figure has plummeted to around two. Average uh, global family size is about 2.5 children, though regional differences remain. Birth rates are still relatively high in sub-Saharan Africa, where in 19 countries, women have five or more children. But in that region, too, birth rates are declining, declining in, especially in urban areas. The number of countries in East Asian and Europe have birth rates below the replacement level of roughly two children per woman and are concerned about this negative population growth. The UN projects that the current world population of seven 3 billion will reach 9.7 billion in 2050 and 11.2 billion in uh, 2100 before it levels off. However, the 11.2 billion projection may be too high and world population could peak at 9.5 billion instead. The main reason we will add 
two to four billion more people to the world's population before it stabilizes, not because women are having too many children. Rather, it's because such a large proportion of the population in developing countries is young and approaching childbearing age. Over time, this baby boom will peter out as the present larger, uh, large generations of young people get older and birth rates continue to decline. Many demographers now worry about how shrinking numbers of young people will support growing numbers of elderly. The challenge that lies ahead is how to plan for these demographic uh, dynamics in social, equity, equitable, and environmentally sustainable ways. I believe, as this book will point out, time management and the putting financial uh, strictness on the dependent section or uh, sector, where taking care of dependents becomes more complicated as time management is impossible. All right. Why then is overpopulation ideology still so entrenched? One reason is that many people are demographically illiterate. This isn't their fault. Population education is woefully inadequate in the United States. Many social studies, biology, and environmental studies textbooks are outdated and still teach students that population growth is exploding out of control. People just don't know that small families are the global norm. Another important reason is that the myth of overpopulation is so politically useful to powerful interests. Elite de elites deploy it to explain and legitimize inequality, essentially blaming the poor for causing their own poverty. Inequality is even worse now than it wa when I wrote this book. The gap between rich and poor has bec become a yawning abyss the bitter fruit of decades of neoliberal economic policies, financial corruption and speculation and dispossession of peasants and small farmers. Overpopulation is a convenient smokescreen that obscures uh, the voracious appetites and power grabs of the super rich. Globally, the bottom 50 of the adults on the wealth scale are now less than 1% of the world's total wealth, while the richest 10% own almost 90%. The top 1% alone owns 50%. The United States is no stranger to this pattern. The top 0.1%, approximately 160,000 families, own almost a quarter of the nation's wealth, a figure that is almost as high as before the 1929 stock market crash. These numbers reveal the real problem. Uh, too few people control too many resources. Overpopulation ideology also obscures the root causes of environmental degradation, a theme explored in this book. Today, population and environmental groups like the Sierra Club, the Center for Biological Diversity, and the World Watch Institute claim that the reducing population growth will magically mitigate climate change. And just to add, it'll also just magically make wars and poverty and everything else go away. You know, it's like if you have five poor people, you kill two of them. Now there's three people in poverty. You pretty much solve nothing. Okay. Industrialized countries with only 20% of the world's population are responsible for 80% of the accumulated carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Overconsumption by the rich has far more to do with climate change than the population growth of the poor. The few countries in the world where birth rates remain relatively high, such as those in sub-Saharan Africa, have among the lowest carbon emissions per capita on the planet. Contraceptives will not solve the climate crisis. Only concerted national and international actions to take the fossil fuel industry, reduce carbon emissions and overconsumption, and shift to renewable energies will do so. So I read this book, uh, One Child. It, it basically said that um, reducing overpopulation would reduce the consumption and thus reduce landfills and the pollution like that. Now, obviously, pollution from smokestacks and uh, power plants, that's different. But it would probably make sense that reducing population would reduce landfills, but um, it really has to do with how we allocate our resources and not necessarily the amount of people creating landfills, but how we could make it so that humans don't use landfill. Like, you know, 
it, it is kind of simple when you say it that way. It's just people think large number and trash and boom. All right. Climate change is the only climate change is only one of the many ways poor people, especially poor people of color, get scapegoated for environmental problems. Take the 2015 coffee table book, Overdeveloped Overpopulation Overshoot, lavishingly produced by the Foundation for Deep Ecology and the Population Media Center. It blames most every ecological crisis on population growth. The book's lurid photographs of the dark-skinned crowd, starving African children, and close-up pregnant bellies rob people of their identity and dignity. That such images are deemed acceptable the book was featured in a number of major media outlets is a testament to how deep the racism like the major river continues to carve the shape the population landscape misogyny flows close behind stanford biologist paul olick famous author of The Population Bomb, told the New York Times in 2015 that letting women have as many babies as they want is like allowing everyone to throw as much of their garbage into the neighbor's backyard as they want. Okay, that's really harsh. Overpopulation ideology is also very useful to national security interests. In the wake of 9-11, population narratives have come to figure uh, uh, prominently in the U.S. War on Terror. The theory that high proportion of young people in population causes youth bulge of angry young men who are easily easy recruits for terrorism, especially of the Islamic variety, is a rationale for racial and ethnic profiling. Analysis in the Pentagon and defense think tanks are now making unsubstantiated claims that population pressure in poor countries is a catalyst for climate conflict and the potential mass migration of climate refugees towards western borders. This militarization of climate change helps uh, legitimize further U.S. military intervention in African and Middle East and even uh, stricter border enforcement. This book ends in 1994 the year of the pivotal UN Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, Egypt, where the international women's health movement pushed hard for a reform. Hopes were high that the plan of action agreed on there would be the world's governments would lead to a new era of population policies and that coercive, target-driven population control programs would give way to a, a broader approach to reproductive health. Based on women's empowerment and freedom to choose. I supported that goal, but predicted that achieving it would be difficult. This lodging population control from family planning and reproductive health programs have proved an uphill battle. Just two years after the Cairo conference, the Fujimori dictatorship in Peru launched a campaign that sterilized an estimated 300,000 indigenous women without their consent. Efforts to reform uh, India's draconian sterilization program faltered. The country is still rocked by sterilization scandal scandals in which poor women die from botched operations and hastily constructed unsanitary camps. The majority of Indian women lack access to temporary contraceptive methods and even the most rudimentary reproductive health care. China's infamous one-child policy wasn't revoked until October 2015. Its tragic consequences from forced abortions and sterilizations and skewed sex ratios to the abandonment and hiding of girl children rank as one of the world's worst government-sponsored human rights violations of the last 30 years. China's experts worry that the new two-child policy will remain authoritarian state control over people's reproductive decisions. After the Cairo conference, feminists and LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning activists were able to wedge open policy spaces where they could push for holistic sexual and reproductive health and rights agenda. Progress was made in providing young people with quality health care, sex education, and birth control, preventing and treating sexually transmitted diseases, challenging sexual violence and homophobia, and making abortion safe. 
legal, and accessible, but the backlash has been and continues to be fierce. There are three key oppositional forces. First, our conservative anti-abortion and anti-gay organizations oppose to any progress on the SRHR front. Many of them have roots in religious fundamentalism of various stripes. Despite Pope Francis' progressive views on climate change and social justice, for example, the Vatican is still opposed to artificial contraception and abortion as well as LGBTQ rights. So, um, some conservative states actually do have in vitro fertilization, but it's very limited and it's not national because of they want to have the, the generational voters. But, and if they make um, in vitro legal in blue or swing states, that could destroy their whole agenda to, um, to uh, allow their voter base to flourish. So, that sounds a little conspiratorial, but it's absolutely not. All right. Second, financial policy and political comments are commitments on the part of national and government, governments and international agencies have adequately materialized. The decade of the 1990s was a hopeful time. Not only Cairo, but other UN conferences on human rights, women's rights, the environment, food, and other major international issues were more inclusive and particularly with activists joining policymakers to hash out new frameworks grounded in the explanation of human rights or expansion of human rights and social, economic, and gender equality. In 2000, the international development clock turned backwards. The UN's Millennium Development Goals abandoned these frameworks in favor of narrow, uh, narrow uh, numerical targets to measure progress. Women's roles were once again reduced to being child bearers and caretakers. Social justice was out and social engineering was back in. Third, the population control old guard hardly faded into oblivion. They were never pleased with the Cairo conference outcome and the broader SRHR agenda. They might have talked about women's empowerment, but for them, the bottom line remains getting women to use contraception in order to reduce population growth. This book tells the story of how beginning in the 1960s, a powerful nexus of population agencies, uh, funders, and pharmaceutical firms distorted the the direction of contraceptive development, health, safety, and freedom of choice concerns took a backseat to the search for the cheapest, most effective methods to reduce population growth, methods that women couldn't control themselves. This is still the case today. There are few, though there are new actors on the scene. Chief among them is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the wealthiest private foundation in the world. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a relative newcomer to the population field, but its influence has been enormous. The present resurgence of population control is due in no small part to its dominant role. The BMGF views contraceptives such as the three-month injectable Deprovova and three-year hormonal implants as a win-win technical fix for reducing population growth and empowering women. Never mind that these methods are associated with serious side effects or, in the case of implants, can be difficult to remove. Studies show that Deprovova may significantly increase the risk of HIV transmission and acquisition, yet uh, BMDF is promoting it vigorously in African countries with high HIV prevalence rates. BMGF has powerful partners, including the U.S. and British governments, the U.N. Fund for Population Activities, and the pharmaceutical giants Pfizer and Bayer. In the United States, a parallel effort, efforts are targeting young, lower-income women and women of color with long-acting, reversible contraception, um, su uh, such as implants and IUDs called LARC for short. LARC is promoted as a panacea for poverty, a strategy that comes uh, perilously close to eugenics. The resurgence of population control policies 
and programs presents formidable challenges to progressive feminist organization organizing, especially as the international women's health movement is no longer such a cohesive force. Professionalization, uh, co-option uh, co co of women's empowerment for population interests and declining funding for radical voices are among the reasons. The many SRHR activists continue to fight the good fight, but it's not easy. The fundamentalist offensive against abortion, contraception, and LGBT rights often or originating in the United States and exploding elsewhere has also made it increasingly significant or increasingly difficult to conduct feminist advocacy on contraceptive safety. Not without cause, activists fear their critique of specific contraceptions, contraceptives will be used by the right to uh, brand all contraceptions as bad, which I have actually been going over lately because this is actually the case. Pro-choice is blamed for mass sterilization. Okay, more hopeful is the emergence of the reproductive justice movement in the United States founded and led by women of color. The RJ movement promotes bodily integrity, health, and reproductive self-determination within a broad context of gender, racial, and social and environmental justice. While supporting access to contraception and abortion, it has taken a firm stand against population control. In recent years, though, population interests have sought to appropriate reproductive justice language. Even coming up with the term population justice, even still, the RJ movement's original principles provide a solid basis for resisting such efforts. Attention to the rich country, to rich histories and legacies of feminist activism against population control is needed now more than ever. The insights gained and strategies used have much to offer contemporary social movements. My great hope is that in the pages of this book, a new generation of readers will find knowledge, argumentation, and inspiration that will help in ongoing struggles to achieve reproductive rights and justice. For making this new edition of Reproductive Rights and Wrongs possible, I would like to... Okay. <clears throat> okay, skipping this part. All right. Forward by Helena Rodriguez, Trias, MD, FAAP. This second, completely updated edition of Betsy Hartman's analysis of population policies and their effect on women's lives offer profound insight, solid research, and vivid case studies from the field to advance our understanding of the origin, development, and action of the organization that have espoused population control since the earliest part of this century. Although most such organizations active in the last four decades have helped women to gain desperately needed access to birth control, they have often limited women's choices by promoting some methods over others, and in their zeal to reduce birth rates, some programs have sh shown blatant disregard for individual rights. Whether undemocratic or respectful of individual choices, all population control programs begin with the basic premise, that is, in order to achieve improvement in people's lives, there is an urgent need to reduce the rate of growth of the world's population. Most aim at reducing the fertility of women, particularly of women in developing countries, as a means of slowing worldwide population growth toward sustainable and stable numbers. It is this very basic premise that Hartman questions. Hartman argues and substantiates that rapid population growth is a symptom rather than a cause of problematic economic and social development, that improvements in the status of women led to voluntary uh, decreases in family size, and that effective birth control services can only thrive within a comprehensive system of healthcare delivery responding to people's needs. Her vision of what people-centered economic and social development may mean include tackling poverty and inequalities. 
Hartman's analysis is particularly relevant to the discussions that have been just taken place on the international stage as I write this forward in September 1994. With greater participation of women than ever before in an international forum, representatives of over 170 nations and of thousands of non-governmental organizations met in Cairo at the United Nations Conference on Population and Development. Delegates discussed and reached consensus on an action plan to slow the growth of population uh, uh, growth of world populations and to promote economic development. In this book, Hartman traces the origin of the push for consensus in Cairo back to the 1984 International Population Conference in Mexico City. In addition to her critique of the centrality of the population's stability to international development uh, deliberation, Hartman points out the marked discrepancy between the large resource allocation for population activities as compared to pitifully small resources for development. Equally important, Hartman cautions that we not be lulled into a, obs, uh, obscuring issues of class, race, and inequalities between developed and develop, uh, developing countries. She notes that, quote, in many population uh, publications, women are presented as an undifferentiated uh, mass which needs to be empowered with little recognition of the many differences between them, poor or rich, rural or urban, black or white, which in turn uh, impact on their survival and reproductive strategies, end quote. Although, with, yeah, this is uh, the, the colorblind method. And it makes them very uncomfortable to have to recognize history because we're in a, a time of peace and we like to just have it all erased and turn digital and, you know, we can just turn it off. All right. Along with several hundred women from the United States and as part of the United States delegation, I attended the Cairo conference rep uh, representing the American public Health Association as its immediate past president. I was one of the, I was one of seventeen private sector advisors to the U.S. delegation, many of whom worked for three-year drafting documents and organizing preparatory meetings for the conference. Some advisors were longtime feminists. Some represented foundations involved in population activities. Others were providers of family planning and other reproductive health services. All were advocates of choice. By emphasizing that any agenda for women's health must advance the political, social, and environmental, or sorry, economic empowerment of women, and providing concrete examples for where women have taken leadership, Hartman's work helped us prepare for Cairo and beyond. In this new edition, Hartman reminds us that discussions on the effect of population growth and environmental degradation pose further pitfalls. Some U.S. environmental organizations are influenced by Malthusian thinking, and a few even advocate severe uh, reduction in human population to restore, restore the wilderness. In urging that women frame environmental issues within an agenda towards social justice, she points out Women's Action Agenda 21, endorsed by 1,500 women in non-governmental groups in advance of the 1992 United Nations Conference on Environmental and Development, or Earth Summit, held in Rio de Janeiro. This document contained a condemnation of suggestions that women's fertility rates are to blame for environmental degradation and identified structural adjustment, militarism, and wasteful and unjust production and consumption patterns as the key culprits in environmental degradation, not population. This book contains examples of activities and programs women have uh, undertaken to improve production, protect the environment, and provide health care in impoverished areas. Out of their experiences as leaders in the field, women are also emerging as leaders in international programs, 
One effect of their participation has been to broaden the international discussion beyond global population growth to the need to improve women's, uh, uh, women's status and all people's quality of life. At home, violence against the reproductive rights movement continues to escalate, as does the intensity of the Viet Cong-led movement to delegitimize the Cairo Agreement on the Reproductive Choice. In confronting the contradictions and dilemmas that we face in attempting to establish women's rights to choose, we do well to heed Hartman, quote, what is needed, she tells us, quote, is a genuinely pro-woman alternative which challenges both the population control and anti-abortion positions and which guides family planning and contraceptive research and health policy. This book and my experience is in the reproductive rights movement led me to urge caution in how we respond to current violent attacks. To forge genuine pro-choice alternatives, we must guard against the tendency to form Two quick alliances when we are confronted by violent uh, opponents. The search for protection from the seemingly powerful forces against women's rights could lead us to ally with population control advocates who speak of women's rights only out of opportunism. We need to keep foremost the alliances of women from different nations, ethnic groups, indigenous peoples, races, and social classes must be based on multiple respects. Uh, mutual respect, adherence to key principles of democracy, and most importantly, on a commitment toward eliminating gross inequalities among groups and nations. In the international arena, I believe that we must avoid what to a large extent has happened in the United States, neglect of social agenda toward equity. Women's organizations have poured an inordinate amount of energy and resources into the defense of abortion rights and not enough into advancing broader women's agenda towards social and economic gains. Greater emphasis on women's social and economic rights by the reproductive rights movement would bring new forces and vigor to the struggle. This book provides us with the inspiration and a basis for working on women's agenda that pursues the reduction the reduction of inequalities among us as a requisite for promoting women's health at home as well as abroad. As Hartman clearly shows, the contradiction and conflicts will not disappear with the uh, issuance of a census document, no matter how, no matter what process leads to its creation. True consensus must rest on genuine commitment. Men with women, uh, white with people of color, rich with poor, landowners with landless, industrialized countries with developing nations to share power, wealth, and knowledge. So, this almost sounds like when Martin Luther King said that, like, we must stand side by side with your oppressor. And I'm pretty sure he was basically making this, like, solidarity message with everybody involved in society, even if they hate you, you can sort of reconcile over time. And I assume Martin knew that this would happen over time, if it was allowed. All right. Introduction. Whose choice? I arrived at the population issue from two, uh, two different directions. Coming of age in the late, sorry. Just checking. Coming of age in the late 1960s, I was a member of the pill generation. While the media extolled the contraceptive revolution as the key to sexual liberation, the college health clinic prescribed the pill with great enthusiasm. Like so many other young women, I soon discovered that the pill made me feel heavy and depressed and that sexual liberation was often a euphemism for being radically available to men. Or sorry, readily. As feminism began to reshape my view of sexual politics, the politics in, in general, I abandoned the pill and returned to the safer barrier birth control methods of my mother's generation. I wondered why the clinic never encouraged their use. Everywhere, some of my friends had far worse experiences, ending up in the hospital 
with IUD complications and worrying that they would never be able to bear children. Then in the late 1970s, my long-standing interest in South Asia and international development took me to a village in Bangladesh, one of my poorest and most densely, uh, one of densely populated countries in the world. Here in the West, Bangladesh is typically thought of as an international basket case, a country whose population growth has already outstripped its resources. In the village, however, I encourage a very different reality. I find I found fertile land, plentiful water, and a climate warm enough to uh, for crops to be grown throughout the year. I met families with six or seven children who ate well, and families with only two children who were starving. The vital difference between them was land ownership. Almost a quarter of the village people owned no land at all and had to work for rich peasants and landlords for pitiful wages. They, they not only lacked the land on which to grow food, they also did not have enough cash to buy adequate supplies in the market. The real problem was not food scarcity, but land and income distribution. Up to a point, villagers viewed children as uh, eras, uh, uh, irreplaceable, an irreplaceable asset. From the earliest age, children worked in the home and the fields instead of draining the family rice bin. They helped fill it. They also provided their parents' only source of security and support in old age. Because of inadequate nutrition and health care, one out of every four Bangladeshi children dies before the age of five. Thus, families had to produce many children in order to ensure that few would survive. My neighbor's first five children had all died in infancy. She bore six more, and the youngest daughter died too. Yet once villagers had enough children to meet their needs, they often wanted to limit family size. They complained about a lack of living space and the fact that that through inheritance, land was being subdivided into smaller and smaller plots, suffering the burden of repeated pregnancies. Women especially were desperate for birth control and repeatedly asked me to help them get it. This widespread desire for birth control came to me as a surprise. Up to that point, it had been to my, my, my understanding that the main obstacle to the use of birth control in Bangladesh and elsewhere in the third world were ignorance and tradition, not the availability of contraception. Now I discovered that many women wanted birth control, but could not get it, even though the U.S. government and other nations were uh, financing million-dollar population control programs in Bangladesh. Later I learned that in other uh, areas of Bangladesh, population control programs were in full force, indiscriminately putting women on the pill, injecting Depo-Prova or inserting IUDs without offering inadequate uh, medical screening, supervision, or follow-ups. Most of the programs only targeted women, ignoring male responsibility for birth control. Due to the poor quality of services, many women experienced negative side effects and became disillusioned with contraception. The government's response was not to reform the program to meet the woman's need, but instead to further intensify its population control efforts by pushing sterilization, even though its irreversibility and risks make it an un, a, uh, unsuitable method for many women. So I've read elsewhere that um, places where they choose to sterilize, women in those locations that want it are denied these uh, resources. And it almost seems like just pure because they hate these women, you know. There's no other reason. If you have a quota for this location and you're willing to sterilize them, but there's women that want it and you're not willing to, that just sounds malicious to me. Like you're going out of your way just to give them a hard time. That's actually twisted. All right. Um, in both instances, whether they lacked access to contraception or had it forced upon them, Bangladeshi women were being denied real control over their own reproduction. As a woman, I cannot help but feel angered and intrigued by the connection between their experience and the experience of many of my peers in the United States. The two directions had converged, and I found myself increasingly absorbed by the population issue. 
On my return to the United States in 1976, I learned that many people were making the same connection. The women's health movement was gaining strength in the campaigns against Deprofova and Dicon Shield IUD and sterilization of abusive women of color were bringing to public attention the misuses of contraceptive technology occurring both at home and abroad. I began to work on the first edition of this book in the summer of 1983. I naively envisioned a six-month project and said it took me over three years. My research followed several different lines. At first, I concentrated on reading a wide spectrum of available population literature. My previous research and writing on international development uh, proved a useful background. Then as, I developed, then, as I developed a framework for the book, I focused more closely on specific countries and contraceptives. I corresponded uh, with people actively involving, involved in family planning, health, and women's issues, particularly in the third world. I use third world in this book for a lack of a better term, but realize it does not accurately reflect the diversity of nations and cultures or the fact that in the current global economy, third world conditions exist in many Western countries as well. In England, where I wrote most of the book, and in the United States, I made contact both with people in the population field and with health and reproductive rights activists, who not only guided me to resources, but gave me crucial feedback and support. For this new edition, I have uh, substantially updated and revised many sections of the book, while preserving its basic organizations. Since the first edition was published in 1987, I have become very, even uh, more involved in population politics. As an activist writer and professor, at times this feels like a personal choice than a, uh, a political necessity. Since population control remains such a powerful force in terms of distorting both development policies and public attitudes, although the work is often difficult, the rewards are many. It is empowering to be a part of a broad international framework of women's health, development, and, inter and environment, uh, environmental activities who are not only fighting against population control, but for reproductive freedom and social justice. In the course of my work, particularly during the Reagan and Bush administration in the United States, I have sometimes been accused of playing into the hand of anti-abortion uh, movement. Better to remain silent about population control abuses, some liberals say, than to provide any ammunition to anti-choice groups which not only oppose abortion, but most forms of birth control. Yeah, well, I mean, they don't want to acknowledge that this is also used as a weapon uh, for wrong. You know, nobody's having all their guns taken away, but for the most part, it is being used like for the wrong reasons so while i'm well aware of the dangers of the anti-abortion movement and religious fundamentalism i reject this logic the population control and anti-abortionist philosophies although diametrically opposed share one thing in common they are both anti-woman population control advocates impose contraception and sterilization on women. The so-called right to life movement denies women the basic right of access to abortion the, and birth control. Neither take the interests and rights of the individual woman as their starting point. But, uh, sorry, both approaches attempts uh, to control women instead of letting women control their own bodies themselves. What is needed is a genuinely pro-woman alternative, which challenges both the population control and anti-abortion positions and which guides family planning, contraception, research, and health policy. If instead pro-choice supporters turn a blind eye to coercive population control practices, they allow the anti-abortion movement to capture the issue and to posture as champions of individual reproductive freedom. Such an uh, abdication of responsibility is not only ethically bankrupt, but politically disastrous. In the course of writing this book, I have come to believe more firmly uh, in the inviolability of individual reproductive rights. The state 
and local community can play an important role in expanding and protecting uh, those rights through education and the provision of health and family planning services. However, no matter how perilous the population problem is deemed to be, and I believe it is greatly over-exaggerated, the use of force or coercive in incentives slash disincentives to promote population control is an unjustifiable intrusion of government power into the lives of its citizenry, amounting in many cases to physical violence against women's bodies. Similarly, the use of government power to deny women access to abortion and birth control is also a violation of basic human rights. I do not believe this stand is culturally specific, simply the product of Western civil uh, libertarian philosophy. As many in the population establishment argue, the United Nations uh, World Population Plan of Action clearly endorsed, uh, endorses the principle that population policy should be consistent with internationally and nationally recognized human rights of individual freedom and justice. While writing this book, I have met many people from different cultures who share this point of view. They are working throughout the world to ensure that women and men have access to safe, effective birth control methods as, as part of not substitutes for more comprehensive health services. At the same time, they are not prepared. Uh, hold on, sorry. At the same time, they are not prepared to see human rights sacrificed on the altar of population control. The philosophy of population control rests upon three basic assumptions. One, rapid population growth is a primary cause of the third world's development problems, notably hunger, environmental destruction, and environment, uh, sorry, economic stagnation, and political instability. Two, people must be persuaded or forced if necessary, to have a uh, few children without fundamentally improving the impoverished conditions in which they live. Three, given the right combination of finance personnel, technology, and Western management techniques, birth control services can be delivered to third world women in a top down fashion and in the absence of basic healthcare systems. In both the development and promotion of contraceptives, uh, advocacy in preventing pregnancy should take pre uh, precedence over health and safety concerns. For over 25 years, this philosophy has shaped the activities of most population organizations and many in international aid agencies in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, as well as among ethnic minorities and, and poor communities in many parts of the industrialized world. The organizations and agencies cons constituting the population establishment have undoubtedly helped in many instances to take uh, to make uh, birth control more accessible. However, as I will demonstrate in this book, when the overriding goal of family planning programs is to reduce population growth rather than to expand the freedom of individuals to decide whether and when to have children. The results are often detrimental to women's health and well-being, and ineffective even in terms of stated goal of lowering uh, birth rates. In contrast to the assumption uh, of the population control philosophy, this book will explain the following. 1. Rapid population growth is not the root cause of development problems in the third world. Rather, is it a... Is it, it is a symptom of those problems. Two, improvements in living standards and the position of women via more equitable social and economic development are the best way to motivate people to want fewer children. Three, safe, effective, and voluntary birth control services cannot be delivered in a top-down technocratic fashion, but instead require the development of a popularly uh, based healthcare system, health, safety, and the individual con individual's control over the methods should be the primary concerns in the development and promotion of contraceptive technologies. 
This book is organized into four parts. Part 1 begins by analyzing the causes and consequences of rapid population growth in order to put the population problem into perspective. This new edition examines more closely the widely held view that population growth poses one of the biggest threats to the global environment. It then describes the reasons why many women lack control over their reproduction and investigates how population control has distorted third world family planning programs. It concludes with case studies of Indonesia and Kenya. Part two traces the history of population control movement and its evolution into the powerful political lobby. It considers how the population control philosophy has changed over time and its impact on various family planning reforms. A new chapter on the 1990s population control consensus analyzes how the U.S. government, mainstream population environmental groups, and the media have ap appropriated the language of women's rights and ecology in a carefully orchestrated campaign to build renewed support for, op for population control. Within the United States, uh, this new consensus has dangerous implications for poor women, especially women of color, as well as refugees and immigrants. Part 2 ends with a case study of China, which currently has the most drastic population control policy in the world. Part 3 examines the forces behind the development of today's major contraceptive technologies. It explains how population control programs have uh, sacrificed women's health and safety in the indiscriminate uh, promotion of hormonal contraception. The IUD and sterilization at the same time as they have been neglected barrier methods and male contraceptives. The neglect of condoms has had particularly serious health consequences given the, the important role they play in preventing the spread of HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. A number of new contraceptives under development, most notably contraceptive vaccines, pose serious risks in both terms of women's health and the potential for abuse. Meanwhile, millions of women around the world are still denied access to safe, affordable abortion. The case of Bangladesh highlights the serious ethical problems with sterilization incentives and with marking population control a higher priority than basic health care. Finally, Part 4 explores the forces behind the demographic transition from high to low birth rates and presents examples of societies that have reduced population growth through more equitable paths of social and economic development. It concludes with an analysis of the impact and future directions of the international women's health movement. While working on the new edition, I have remained convinced that population control not only restricts reproductive choice, but dangerously obscures the real causes of the Earth's afflictions, helping to perpetuate poverty and heighten racial and ethnic tension, tensions, while the affluent few regard the impoverished majority as simply a dark, faceless crowd overpopulating the earth. They deny poor women their humanity and diminish their own. At a time when fundamentalism and neo-fascism are on the rise, when free trade and unfettered consumerism are eroding community and threatening the environment, and when economic austerity measures and diseases such as AIDS threatens the very survival of poor people, we cannot afford to erect such an unnecessary barrier between human rights. My hope is that this book in some way will contribute to removing that barrier. I have understood the population explosion intellectually for a long time. I came to understand it emotionally one stinking hot night in Delhi a few years ago. The streets seemed alive with people, people eating, people washing, people sleeping, people visiting, arguing and screaming, people thrusting their hands through the taxi window, begging, people defecating and urinating, people clinging to buses, people hurting animals, people, 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 people. Since that night, I've known the feel of overpopulation. A quote by Paul Elwick, The Population Bomb. And Cloud Levi-Strauss says, Once the 
Uh, once men begin to feel cramped in their geographical, social, and mental habitat, they are in danger of being tempted by the simple solution of denying one section of the species the right to exist. Part 1. The Real Population Problem So, I'm going to read this in the next video. Thanks for watching if you have. Like and subscribe.